no surprise to anyone who is a fan of comic books, especially from the big two, that comic book companies are anything if not stupid animals trying to kill themselves and us, their fans, me included, at times mirror them in this general stupidity. No bigger example of this exists than the speculative bubble of the 90s and the crash it brought. This is the Red Chaos One channel, the home of the one and only YouTube Pope from Earth One. And remember, if you like the video, please leave a like, a comment, and subscribe because it really helps grow the channel and I would very much appreciate it. A speculative bubble is usually caused by exaggerated expectations of future growth, price, appreciation, or other events that could cause an increase in asset values. The bubble is not completed until prices fall back down to normalized levels. And our speculative bubble can be traced back to the 90s, the time of the Attitude Era. Fanny packs, beanie babies, and the near death of the entire damn comic book industry. So a damn great time to be very much alive. See, while we live in a time where comic book movies are killing it at the box office and dominating popular culture, and the reading of comic books isn't something that people frown upon, this unfortunately hasn't always been the case, as most superhero comics were made mainly for child audiences and were viewed as simple disposable culture. And this is very much how the people of the times looked at them. And remember, we're going to come back to this disposable culture thing in future. So this view of comics as the funny books for kids changed with the creation and popularity of comic books like Watchmen, The Dark Knight Returns, and the Tim Burton Batman film. That showed mainstream audiences that comics could be more than just kid stuff and could be taken seriously again and allowed many con comic book fans to, you know, proverbially, proverbially come out of the closet of being fans of comics. Comics were no longer mainly sold to kids in drugstores but to adults in dedicated comic shops. That changed how they were thought of and valued. With this new attention on comics, it saw a sale of old issues, old comic book issues. Now remember how I said that comics back in the days were viewed as simple, disposable culture? Well, because of this, Few people had actually taken care of old vintage comics, and as such, there were very few left in public circulation, and these suddenly became hot properties. Jonathan V. Last gave an extremely good explanation on what it was like at the time. So, I'm quoting directly from him right now. And he stated, in 1974, you could buy an average copy of Action Comics number 1, the first appearance of Superman, for about $400. By 1984, that comic cost about $5,000. This was real money, and by the end of the decade, comic book sales at auction houses such as Christie's and, Th and Sort Buys were so impressive that the New York Times would take note when... For instance, Detective Comics number 27, the first appearance of Batman, sold for a record-breaking $55,000 in December 1991. The Times was there again a few months later when the copy, when a copy of Action Comics number 1 shattered that record, selling for $82,500. Comic books were as hot as a market could be. At the investment level, high-level comics were appreciating at a fantastic rate. At the retail level, comic book stores were popping up all over the country to meet a burgeoning demand. As a result, even comics of recent vintage saw giant price gains. A comic that sold initially for 60 cents could fetch a 1000% return on the investment just a few months later. So suddenly, you could see rags to riches stories everywhere, and they were, and where there is money, people will flock to it like starving lions to a carcass, all trying to tear at it. Everyone and their mother began to buy new comics that they hoped would become the next future Action Comics number one or Detective Comics number twenty-four. 
This trend was not lost on the publishing world. It wasn't until comic book publishers it wasn't long until public until comic book publishers began to ca- began to ca- began to cater to speculator market to the speculator market directly. Amongst these was the introduction of variant covers, which are variations of popular comic book issues with a superficial difference, mainly usually an alternative cover printed in limited quality. While the practice of variants remains in the comic book industry to this day, they reached their peak in the mid-90s and included various gimmicks such as holographic covers, embossed covers, foil stamped, and so forth. This promoted a buying frenzy for speculators eager to find value in these limited editions. An example of this is how X-Men number one had about five variant covers, one to be released each week for five weeks. First issues and first appearances of characters which proved to be historically very valuable, just look at Superman action number one selling for 80, 80, $82,500 and Batman and Detective Comics number 27 selling for $55,000 just to show you how valuable early character appearances could be. So publishers then engineered the launch of whole new comic lines. This saw all sorts of new characters being pulled out of the company's a-holes and whole new relaunches just so that more and more speculators could buy them. This led to more and more comics being pumped out in the hope that speculators could buy them with the hope that they could become valuable in the future. Unfortunately, an effect of this saw a lot of quantity but very few quality because everyone wanted to make new characters to make that hot money. And that just wasn't happening. So there wasn't much attention given to the creation of these new characters. Like, you can go and look to old comics Very few 90s characters are still alive today because of just how terrible they were or they were just made for that whole, well, they might be profitable in future because this is their first appearance. Now, both the companies and the speculators forgot one simple thing. Pristine pristine copies of Action Comics No. 1 or Detective Comics No. 27 actually were reasonably rare and valuable because no one thought that they'd be valuable back in the depression era days of their first printing as well as also the fact that during there weren't that many printed out during that time because well there wouldn't be that much paper and also by the time World War II came around there were heavy rations on paper so lots of these comics weren't mass published and so they weren't that much published in the first place and also due to the fact that, that not that many people saw them as being valuable that much, most copies had ended up in the garbage. Now to show you what was happening here in simpler terms, what do you think would happen if gold became as easy to find as the common rocks that are outside your home? It would lose its value, obviously. Comic book companies were also screwing themselves over by making more and more comics with the idea that they could make up their dollars with the speculators who in turn thought that the dime a dozen comics would be gold in future even though everyone in their grandmother's ghost had gold. People soon found that their recent number ones would be worthless in future because everyone owned that same comic. That helped spark the burst in sales that crashed the industry for the rest of the decade. The market mania also degraded the quality of the comics, like I said earlier, via stupid stunts and endless crossovers in an attempt to keep sales inflated, turning off a whole generation of fans, which is bad because comics still kept publishing more comics than people were there to buy. And so were stores leading to large stacks of comics that had nothing to do that act as fuel to burn the industry alongside the money that was being wasted making them, ordering them, and paying for them. One 
comic book retailer from the time, though this interview, I'm not quite sure if it's before the crash happened or it was during the crash or after it. But what they said really shows you how much was being wasted here. They stated, the week number one A came into the shop, it was like a feeding frenzy at the zoo. I had over 10 boxes full of just one comic. When my standard weekly delivery normally consisted of two or three boxes with everything in, I had people three deep at the counter buying five copies of this first issue. We sold 75% of them in the first week. 1B arrived a week later and you could see the tumbleweed sweeping across the shop floor. I had a cellar full of X-Men number ones and I knew a fellow I, I knew a fellow shop owners who had even more. Now starting in June, the market contracted by 10% each month. The impact would be felt throughout the comic book industry. 9 out of 10 comic book stores closed down. Big publishers like Valiant Comics, which was once the third largest comic book publisher in the industry, alongside other smaller numerous comic book publishers including the likes of Eclipse, Comico, and Malibu, and many, and many, many more went under. Marvel also declared bankruptcy, with Scott Sass stating, when the business turned, it was like everything had gone, could go wrong, did go wrong. So, what do we learn from the speculative bubble? Number one, comic books companies are stupid animals. Number two, Trend chasing without an actual plan on what the hell you're doing is very, very stupid. Number three, quantity over quality can only take you so far. I hope this video has been enjoyable to you guys. I hope I didn't bore you. I, I know if this is my usual stuff, I'm usually talking about web novels, but I'm a big kind of fan, so I just, you know, wanted to talk about it. So yeah, this has been Red Chaos 1, signing off.